Good evening, everyone. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Thank you. Welcome to the closing plenary of uh, this year's World Economic Forum on Africa. It's uh, very exciting for all of us, uh, most of us young, and some of us a little bit older, probably. I was told yesterday that in Africa, I'm actually too old, um, to come and discuss Africa's future. Um, I think we've had a couple of days of very exciting conversations about everything that can happen on the continent. And I think a lot of you here are investors, policymakers, development partners who are here because you believe that you can make a difference for Africa. So I've, I've, I thought we would start maybe with a little bit of a survey, a very scientific survey. Um, so I'm going to ask you to raise your hand uh, in, in, in response to the question that I ask. How many people uh, here believe that Africa has a bleak future? Raise your hands. Okay, two or three cases. How many believe that Africa is very, very promising? Raise your hands. Wow, that's all of us. Okay, so I thought I would actually tell you a story. As you know, in Africa, we, th we, we think through stories. This is the story of a leader that had a lot to offer. Uh, he was actually the wealthiest person of his time. The person only had one daughter, and the leader actually decides that he's going to give the hand of his daughter. He makes a promise. I'm going to give the hand of my daughter to whoever can help uh, create more butterflies. The reason is very simple. The daughter loves butterflies. So everybody comes. They come from other parts of the world. They try all sorts of techniques. Some people try to put two butterflies in the same room. Others give them some food to eat. They try all sorts of things. Nothing works. A young person comes and brings a cocoon. This person says, I promise you that if you give me the following elements out of this cocoon, I will create a butterfly. And somehow, it is this young person that ended up marrying the princess and really did well. As I think about where Africa is right now, I think we are in the middle of a metamorphosis. People used to think of the continent almost like you think of a caterpillar, right? Something that goes very, very slowly, something that is not really that attractive, uh, something that's defined by all the limitations. I think we are at a time now where people start recognizing that there is potential. And I think there are so many stories that can really support this particular uh, trend. And what we're trying to do now is to figure out exactly how do we go from the cocoon to the butterfly. And I'm hoping that with the panel that we have today, uh, who are a combination of uh, social entrepreneurs, entrepreneurs, and young global leaders, shapers, we can have the perspective of Africa's future to define Africa's future. So let me start maybe with Martin. When we think about this issue of Africa uh, rising, what are your views on it? Thanks, Eric. You know, you used two words a couple of minutes ago, bleak or promising. Yep. Both are the antithesis of each other. Both are poles apart. The, all of us in this room, and I believe it's the largest gathering in Africa of a forum ever, are here largely because we believe in the narrative that has been set by The Economist magazine, the Africa Rising narrative. But some of you, a few people put their hand up and agreed with a bleak scenario. Let me tell you why I think that is. I think there's three, for me, there's three narratives of Africa. Firstly, there's the Africa Rising narrative. 
And it's great. It's robust growth, rising consumers, consumer spending. And that's good news. But arguably, it's a continent which is being viewed through the eyes of a salesman. A billion Africans buying things, that's fantastic. But it's too simplistic. The second narrative is that of growth versus development. I think many of us are confusing the growth story with the development story. For example, the continent, according to, I heard Donald Kabaruka say this week from the African Development Bank, the continent will grow, sub-Sahara, excluding SA, 6.6% this year. Now that's a fantastic story. I also saw another slide um, by Max, Max Harris from UCT. He put up a slide showing the, uh, the nature of a workforce from professional to low skilled. And this slide struck me because the country of the highest GDP per capita on this continent is Equatorial Guinea, 17,500 US dollars. Equatorial Guinea. Now, apologies if anyone's from Equatorial Guinea, but it also had the lowest caliber, lowest qualified workforce, according to that slide. The numbers are deceiving us. There's a growth story, there's a development story. Both are very different. The third narrative, and I'll end on this, Eric, is the corporate story. And many of us are here, many of you are here for this reason. The opportunity from a business perspective, the corporate story to create shareholder value, whether it's an African exchange or a foreign exchange in Africa, to capture consumers is significant, is massive. Undoubtedly, we are almost emerging as the new India almost, or new Asia in some instances. More on that later. But these are the three narratives. And it, it, it's all between the two parameters of what you said. There's the Africa rising, the consumer story, there's the growth versus development story, and ultimately, there's this corporate story. Now, I think to view it and overlay each one um, and view the continent through those three combined lenses, one starts to get a far better understanding. Perhaps there's another one, and that's geography. Many countries to talk about are winning in the continent. Some are faltering. Some, dare I say, have failed if we have not yet already realized it. So the conclusion being, Africa is an extremely heterogeneous, complex continent. The Af there is no African narrative. It has to be narrowed down through three or perhaps even four lenses. Excellent. I also want to mention that uh, this is a fully digital session. So if you have any questions as we speak, feel free to tweet them. We are also going to have a Q&A. And I would like to invite uh, some of the participants that are not physically here with us to really uh, send the questions our way. So I would like maybe to go now to Rappelang to really ask you about this issue of mobile education. I think everybody agrees that to realize the potential, we need to figure out a way to unleash the talent that we have. How do we use technology to make that happen? Sure, thank you very much, Eric. Um, my name is Rappelang and I'm a global shaper from the Cape Town Hub. Um, I think from all the sessions I attended, the education question was very broad and to sort of try to package those discussions, um, I think all the initiatives and innovations can be put into three categories. We looked at a lot in knowledge acquisition, knowledge retention and synthesis and if we look at those three learning areas, we realize that in that knowledge acquisition area where it's about the initial exposure to knowledge, classrooms still need to be reinforced and the teacher still has a critical role to play um, in schools and there is not necessarily anything that technology can do to remove that part and um, all those socioeconomic factors that are affecting that area still need to be attended. When we look, however, at the next level or the next stage about sort of knowledge retention, how are we reinforcing and um, rebuilding or building up that knowledge once someone has been exposed to it, whether it was in a seminar or um, or in a classroom environment, then we see a great opportunity there for technology and mobile phones to play a greater role as, it's, it's, as it lends an opportunity to provide small chunks of information that can be um, sort of built up and repeated until a sufficient level of retention is achieved. Um, there's opportunities in gaming where additional sort of um, content and learnings can be um, reinforced and put into place there. So. 
we then get to the next level of around knowledge sort of synthesis and how does one move to the next level of critical thinking and um, knowledge assimilation and we've seen a number of initiatives happening across the continent around mentorship, apprenticeship and how these need to be formalized and accredited officially and formally so that young people can build on the initial skills that they have built up um, but become job ready through these kind of mentorship and apprenticeships programs. So I think we came to a realization that there isn't a silver bullet to all of these things and specific learning areas do require um, different forms and technology isn't necessarily going to be able to help all of that. Thank you, Rapalang. Younes, you come from Morocco, Arab Spring. How do young people feel right now in North America? Yes, Eric. Uh, firstly, I want to say uh, thank you to the World Economic for this very powerful forum. When I came here in Cape Town, I was uh, sincerely not pessimist, but pragmatic. And uh, I will leave the mother city more optimistic than ever, because I believe that is our responsibility to give confidence and to fight against Afro-pessimism. It's our responsibility. Yep. So uh, about Arab Spring, uh, the president of uh, Cap Verde said yesterday, revolutions have dated. Uh, I believe that today uh, our citizens want reforms, want transparency. They want us to prioritize because they have many demands. So for me, we have in our countries two main challenges. The first one is we need to have an inclusive and a high value added growth. It's not only about GDP. And the second challenge is that we need, in our countries, competitiveness. Because we cannot compete with the developed countries without competitiveness. Thank you so much, Venus. Thank you. Aminata, any, any views from Mali? Um, hi, my name is Aminata Nyang from Mali, the Bamako hub, Global Shaper. Um, views on Mali, I don't know if, um, how familiar you're with the history of Mali right now, where we had a coup d'etat last March in 2012, and um, things have not been stabilized yet. We still don't have, we have a transitional government for right now, and we have elections happening in June, in July. So for me, being a young person in Mali, I recently moved to Mali three years ago, and it's, um, it's not that easy um, it's not easy being a young person, especially being a female in a male, um, like a Muslim dominated country. So um, my experience is being a young person, there's lots of cultural and ge uh, gender inequalities that we need to tackle. Um, sorry. Thank you, thank you very much. And I think this is really one area where I think you, you, you actually were thinking about how to address this issue. And I love that the panel uh, has three very strong women leaders here. And I think this is something that's important. How, how do you see it? How do we address it? Um, I think that we have a really, really exciting opportunity. As I was thinking about this session, I found this proverb that I thought I would like to share. Okay. It's from Nigeria, and it reads like this. Unity among the cattle makes the lion lie down hungry. <laughs> and I think what for me has come through in this last three days is a real sense of unity and purpose amongst all the African delegates who are here. Okay. Um, and, and the global partners, sorry, I just was talking about the African story. <laughs> but I think, um, you know, I stand here as a woman who spent 15 years of my career, my first career in sort of the public service sphere. Um, and, and I found that in there, I always felt that I could do whatever it is that I wanted to do. I was not limited because I'm an African woman. And I think this is because of how I was brought up in the schools that I went to. But then I entered this very interesting space of uh, entrepreneurship and innovation. Uh, I work now in the mobile space. Um, and it's been a very, 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 very steep learning curve because it's, it's been very male dominated, but also very youth dominated. So I'm almost like the mama mobile of this environment where I operate. 
Um, but what I see as I listen to, I've listened to the conversations, I think there's two, two messages that I've heard that really, really resonate and I will leave this place with. The one was by um, uh, uh, Minister Borg, 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 right? Borg from Sweden, when we were listening to the Africa 2063 discussion. And when he shared the story about how in 2063 he will return uh, to visit Masai Mara with his great, -grand great granddaughter. And his great granddaughter will say to him, so is it true that many, many, many years ago, Africa was a poor country, poor continent, or Kenya was a poor country? And I thought, imagine if we could plant this idea and this vision in the hearts and minds of every single young African in this continent. What would that do for the promise that we, we, we have? That's the one. The other message that I think is so powerful came from Minister Ngozi, who's sitting right here. I heard this from her maybe six months ago, and I heard it resonating again here. And it's the message about women being the third emerging market, or emerging economy. I think this is a powerful message. We have women in Africa, in fact, there's statistics showing that, and in those conversations about that in one of uh, the sessions that I attended, that, for instance, in West Africa, and many of us in East and Southern Africa need to go to West Africa and learn from our sisters. Because over 50% of the economy and the growth and some of the development is, is coming from women traders. Now, if we were able to translate that to many other countries across this continent, but also begin to do whatever it is we need to do in the regulatory framework to actually support the translation of this trade um, and activity of women in the economic sphere. We honestly can deliver on this promise of 2063. And all of us will be going to Masai Mara and talking about, do you recall when Africa was a poor country mm -hmm. or poor continent? Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, Anne. That really brings me to something important that you said, which is, how do we make sure that the promise becomes real? And I think we come to these events and we get ideas, we get energy, uh, we love what we see, we love what we hear, but how do we turn some of these uh, elements into actual results? How do we implement? So I, I thought it was really important for us to get into this discussion of specific actions that can be taken so that we all go back home and on Monday we can say, you, based on the forum, here are things that I think I learn or things that I think I can do. Uh, and I would like to maybe ask our panelists to react to two or three questions. One on talent. Anything exciting you heard about the issue of talent? Any sort of, yeah? Sure. Um, I think as a, as a young person, I was definitely most interested on the issues around youth and um, development and entrepreneurship and the like. And I think one of the occurring sort of statistics and issues has always been around youth employment and what are we doing about the 75 million odd unemployed youth around the world. Um, and then at the other side of the conversation, it was, there's always been a lot of discussion around there's so much to do and so much to fix in Africa, so many services still to provide. And I think um, at least sort of within the Global Shapers community, there's been this um, paradigm or thinking shift where we, we want to rather match this sort of asset base of young people, this youth bulge that's coming out with, with the need to, to deliver more and to deliver on the promise of Africa. And it's really about saying that while there may not be this abundant sort of jobs as such, there's certainly no shortage of work to be done. And it's about empowering rather the young people to be able to do that work. And that really sort of comes back to the issue of education and entrepreneurship. Um, how do we not just improve education, but how do we ensure that young people actually believe that they can bet on themselves and not the government and not their neighbor and that they must be the ones to get up and do something. And on the entrepreneurship landscape, how do we better support entrepreneurs and create that environment that will ensure that success? Um, too many entrepreneurs are facing, most of the challenges they face are sort of environmental and infrastructural rather than the internal business problems that bring them to failure. And fixing those areas around education and sort of um, entrepreneurship can actually allow us to unlock that youth talent and um, enable people to do, this, to do the work and apply the significant amount of human endeavor required. Any other ideas? Sure. You know, I think we have what I'm calling the forgotten talent. Um, so we have this beautiful growth. We've seen the growth. Who is going to translate it into development? 
every one of our countries, maybe say for South Africa, but even then, I think every one of our countries, the largest employees of our countries <clears throat> are government. It's public servants. And I know that many people say that our focus should be to get private sector, it's the engine of development, and that the governments should just focus on creating the enabling environment. But actually, the people who are to translate that growth into reality for our people are the health workers, are the teachers, are the, are the, are the extension workers in agriculture. But we know that they're, they're like a forgotten talent. The training is almost irrelevant, it's unexciting. Um, if we could tap that resource and begin to take this thinking around entrepreneurial thinking into the public service. I mean, I've been thinking to myself, what if we created challenges and we say to the Ministry of Health, we're going to have challenges where you create enterprises that deliver health services. It has to be something that people can afford. It has to be something that is designed in a manner that people will buy because it's a value service and start creating value services in the public service in new ways. It's a forgotten talent. If we tap that talent, I believe we can translate this promise in very, very exciting ways. And so let's not forget the public servants. Thank you so much. I think it's a very important point because uh, if we can really provide the incentives for the public service to, to do what they know how mm. to do best, I think the potential is huge. What about the financial uh, markets and financial services? Younes? Well, uh, I'm coming from Morocco and uh, we think that uh, we have all the potential in our continent. And when we see, uh, like our company, we think that Africa is the future of our growth in Morocco. Uh, and uh, we think that we have all the power to expand in the continent. So for instance, our bank is now in more than 10 countries. And uh, when European uh, countries uh, leave the continent, like uh, French banks or other banks, our banks from Nigeria, from Morocco, from Togo, expand in the continent. That means that we have the potential, and uh, the two issues today about finance is how to decrease the high rate of interest. Uh, and for that, we need to decrease the risks. And the second issue is how to help the small companies, small businesses. They are the two main issues today in our continent in terms of finance. Thank you. Thank you very much. I would like to really come back to uh, try and integrate the two points that you made around uh, both the sort of talent and the capital. So what do we do when we know that we have some forgotten talent, when we know that we have women, when we know that we have youth? How do we integrate this in a very practical manner? It's for me. It's for anyone in the panel. It's open. I, I think that there needs to be some new conversations. I feel that the conversation between labor and training institutions and ministries of education um, are happening really at the periphery. It is not a serious conversation. And so our institutions of learning are still producing labor that is not um, immediately applied to the needs of the countries where we are. And so we need to have new types of conversations. And I think those of us who are in the spaces of innovation and mobile education and so on, part of what is happening is that we, are tr we find a huge gap um, in new types of learning. And so really what we're trying to figure out is how do you start creating this new conversation that's ongoing where there is a constant check between um, where capital sits and where labor is produced or where talent is produced. How do we start making it relevant? And all the way from, from primary school. We see two things in our continents. First thing in terms of education, for instance, when we look to the 450 best universities of the world, we have only three in Africa. When we see also the workers, only 30% of the workers have, uh, you know, uh, good jobs and they're not in informal jobs. So uh, we need to prioritize and we need to invest in education, in competencies and in knowledge in our continent. Can we go back to the issue of the industrialization? Because I think this is really one of the topics that has been really under the surface. How do we change the structure of the economy? How do we transform uh, Africa as it stands today? Yes, Martin? Eric, just um, stringing together a couple of statistics I've, I've heard this week. I heard earlier today that within 10 years' time, 500 million, it's half a billion, Africans will be living in cities. 
half a billion. I'm also told how many Africans actually work in factories in sub-Saharan Africa. The number I was told, 10 million. I'm deeply concerned. Unlike China, which is generating roughly 15 million new jobs every year, never mind entrepreneurs, formal jobs, formal economy jobs. We spoke about this in a, in a, in a discussion yesterday. Um, China's engagement of Africa has been characterized by state capital into hard infrastructure, into extractive industries, largely. What we'll see, that was the last, that's the last decade story. The next, next decade story is a third wave of deindustrialization in Asia. Japan in the 80s, Korea in the 90s, and China now. Significantly bigger than the previous two. We will see, according to Justin Lin uh, figures, 85 million jobs, 85 million jobs depart China in the next decade. If only we capture 10% of those departing jobs, which are currently going to Southeast Asia, if Africa is able to capture 10% of the departing jobs that the Chinese economy is hemorrhaging, will hemorrhage next decade, Martin, but let me we stop double you. our workforce. How do we do that? How? The how is, we are on the cusp, and this is an extreme statement, but I truly believe it, Eric. We're on the cusp of a 19th century style industrial revolution. We are. If only we realized it. We must not have these conversations in a vacuum. We must be aware of the shifting dynamics in the global economy. In this case, it's China away from a resources story to a deindustrialization story. How do we do it? More agile policymakers, more agile states attracting, like Southeast Asian economies are doing, there are new competition, the Vietnam, the Myanmar's, the Thailand's, even the Philippines. That's our new competition in Africa. If we're able to attract those jobs by creating, easy to say, and, and mentioned the phrase, and entirely correct, better enabling environments for manufacturing, our business model can no longer rely on, on, on digging holes, to be quite frank. We have to create far more complex, deeper value chain manufacturing economies and that opportunity is no longer politically driven out of Beijing, but market driven out of the entire Chinese economy. Okay. Ines? Well, uh, we cannot accept that with 40% of the strategic natural resource of the world, mm -hmm. we don't transform them in our continent. So it's the first thing. We need to transform our resources in our continent. How? So uh, we need to invest uh, I can take the example of Ghana with their fund to invest in uh, industry. We can speak also about the plan uh, of industry decided in Addis Abeba. We don't see nothing for the moment, but we have two priorities. The first thing is we need uh, to help and to make stronger our integration. When I take the example of Maghreb, the intra trade uh, between the countries is less than 3% of GDP. Mm -hmm. And for all the continent, we are far from Asia, Europe, and Latin America. So integration is a priority. And when I speak about integration, I speak from the north, North Africa, including to the south, east to west. And the second thing, we need to benchmark with our brothers of Asia, of the emerging markets of Asia. Why we don't have uh, special zones, special industrial zones with uh, tax preferences? We need to be attractive. and. Uh, we are coming, the coming years, we will have one of the most, the most important workforces and the most important youth of the world. So we can help also the Europe, Europe to be more competitive. So you need to, we need to have attractive zones, we need to be attractive, and we need to give a good climate environment for the foreign countries. Yes, if I can just pick up for a sec, there's, there's a second, there's two major trends, and Eunice is totally correct, integration. Um, you know, in the days of the BRICS, which was spoken about yesterday, is, is big markets are beautiful for capital, attractive to capital. Arguably, many of our states on this continent are perhaps, arguably, economically non-viable. Their survival exactly. depends on integration. However, however, there's a very paradoxical trend I'm seeing here in many countries, and Eunice, not too far away from, from your country, mm -hmm. is we're seeing almost it's integration of economic necessity, but politically I'm seeing disintegration 
in many cases. Exactly. We've seen it in Sudan, we've seen it in the Horn of Africa, we will see it increasingly in Francophone and Central Africa. So how do you sort of reconcile, yes, integration is imperative, but the political forces increasingly are towards disintegration. And I think this is a, a conversation that, uh, around the future of Africa, which really is very, very complex for us to start to, to engage on. I think there is uh, one fact which I heard, which really stuck with me, this idea of uh, one million person moving into, uh, actually five million, I think I heard, moving into cities uh, in Africa uh, every month. So I'm trying to see whether or not the panel, there is anything that you heard which really touched you, or things that, facts that you had, or ideas that you're going to act on that you think are important. Anything comes to mind? Anne? I think one that I heard that was very powerful, and I think there's three, two or three countries that mentioned this in some of the panels, was the idea of actually being very deliberate about who accesses what government resources. Um, and that procurement can be designed very, very specifically to ensure that women access procurement so that jobs are created in that space, mm -hmm. um, as, well as, uh, um, as well as young people. And I thought that was very, very powerful. Um, the other one that I thought was, was very powerful was this issue that I raised about the public service. I think that there was an example shared, I think, by the Rockefeller um, 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 CEO who mentioned that I think the UK has started to create this sort of entrepreneurship training for public servants. I think that for me is something that we need to take into our schools of management development and take in you know, very seriously. Um, Thank you. Yeah. Mineta? Okay. Um, for me, something that was very powerful um, that I over kept overhearing is how exemplary um, countries like Kenya and Rwanda are um, in the sense that they're able to, like inter for inter um, integration-wise, they're able to um, separate barriers, like um, turn down the barriers, like borders about, like for example, visas. I know there's a lot of people that were, had difficulties with visas. So some, that's something that we really need to tackle, that, was, um, that we need to tackle. We need to facilitate exchange, import, important ex, um, export exchanges between our countries. Excellent. Well, so about the, when you speak about the cities, so uh, I think I, I will speak about, again, about the necessity of an inclusive uh, growth. So we see more and more inequalities and many times we speak about rural inequalities, yep. but uh, I see the reports, uh, for instance, the reports of UNICEF uh, in Morocco, in other African countries, we have more and more inequalities in the cities. So I, I think that we need to tackle these inequalities, we need to fight against poverty, and for our economy diversification, we need to have three things in mind. Uh, we need to give food, so agriculture productivity is very important. We have the lands, and the second thing is health, and the third thing is education. So there are our three priorities for the cities of tomorrow, for the countries of tomorrow. Rachel? Um, I think there have been two sort of concepts that have stuck out in my mind. The first one was sort of the iteration of this, the fact that Africa is growing much younger while the rest of the world is growing a lot older. How this um, expanding youth bulge can be matched to the use of technology because ultimately um, the take up of mobile technology and services happens a lot more often mm -hmm. in the youth population and what a great advantage Africa will be at combining this youth bulge and the use of mobile technology to provide a myriad of services not just um, in terms not just in terms of education but providing general information around entrepreneurship and job opportunities and providing health services agricultural information and what a tremendous unique opportunity opportunity that will be going forward um, that can be applied to Africa. The sort of second major idea that stuck with me was around being more open and more transparent. And this comes a lot with regards to the information that a lot of public sector institutions and some private institutions hold around education and health and how, or even things like weather patterns and things, and how much more we can do if we co-create, but for that to happen, there must be a transparency and open data for people to be able to access data and apply more value to it so that um, 
data can be extracted and repackaged in the right format for whatever recipient is required. And that co-creation process is essential to be able to scale innovations, to scale whatever we're doing in a small package. And things like open source technologies and open data um, partnerships are going to be essential for, for things to be able to go beyond a single organization or a single country. Thank you. Martin? I agree. But great <laughs> to add, to add, is um, I think very simple. All of this is correct, but underpinning uh, all of this conversation, I think in the conversations we've had over the last few days um, here at the forum, is there needs to be, uh, beyond the lip service, there needs to be a deeper realization. And this is the developmental um, case study of Asia. Is Africa the next Asia? That's the question. And it'll only come about when all of us realize, particularly, particularly leaderships, that a most valuable asset in this continent is not what's on the ground or under the ground, but what is potentially in our people. And no country has ever succeeded, has ever become wealthy, has developed without industrialization. And that Great. takes some serious human talent and complexity to manage. So basically, talent first. <laughs> so let's open the conversation to all of you and see if there are any particular questions or reactions. I would like to also invite uh, people, instead of just asking questions, if there are specific actions or investments or things that you will do out of the forum, it would also be nice to share some of them. Yeah? I think there are some questions here. My name is Henry Ebiki. I work for Einstein Young, and I'm based in Nigeria. My question is, we've uh, discussed a lot of issues. A lot of innovative ideas have come out of this uh, forum. Um, a lot of actual points. But I'm just wondering, Africa is not a country, it's a continent. I mean, Africa is not a continent, it's a country of 54. Uh, it's a continent of 54 countries. Yeah. What platform do we have to actually ensure that this, all these innovations, innovative ideas that we put on the table are actually implemented. And that when we come back, maybe in a year's time, we can begin to take off some of these social points. Okay. Thank you. Let's take a couple of other uh, points. There is one here, there is one over there. So let's go to the lady first. Good afternoon. My name is Lourdes Caposo Fernandez. I'm from Angola. And I would like to give two words, one for Davis and one for Niang. Uh, for Davis, I would like to emphasize the point that he just made at the end, which is related to the people. Uh, we need to concentrate really on people. African people, uh, can especially, you give us your question? especially a woman, is, uh, has special, special capacities. So I think if we concentrate on the ease, so like ethical, education, economic, on, uh, on this Africans, we have success. So that is my advice since you ask us to also recommend. So I would, I would stress young, since I'm feeling not young, even with the age I have, uh, to go further on the education, more on the science and techno technological points. That thing, yes, we can fight with, the, or we can follow the lessons from Asia. Regarding the, friend, the brother, sister from Mali, we Africans, especially women again, we are strong. Don't be scared to come back to our country and help. We all are strong Africans. What Mali is, is living now, Angola and uh, other many countries they live, and we pass through. We just need to believe that the future in the world is in Africa now. Thank you. A couple of questions here. Um, so, yeah, my name is uh, Atul Znapia. I'm from the Accra Global Shippers Hub uh, in Ghana. And uh, since you mentioned uh, talking about statements, I'll make yes. uh, something like a statement. I think it's very important um, that, you know, uh, some of us who are global shippers, you know, young people, um, older people, to be able to um, really try to influence the youth. Um, I heard something today about uh, the youth could be Africa's blessing, but it could also be Africa's curse. Yep. I see a lot of cases whereby youth are being used to do a lot of wrong 
on the continent. And I think it's very important that um, a lot of us African youth um, are able to reach out to people that might be used for some of these things and to be able to change their mindset so that they are used to do good. So that if, you know, sometimes maybe if a leader wants to get them to go and do something that we don't want to see on the continent, that doesn't happen. And I think, you know, like we, we don't really have that many degrees of separation with these people. You know, so I think in many cases we have to be able to reach um, the youth in general, change their mindset, make them more positive, make them more positive about Africa, about leading Africa now, delivering Africa's promise now. Thanks. Okay. One last one and then we get some reactions. Yeah. Thank you. Um, my question is, um, it's all great to look at the continent and say we're rising, look at great statistics that have been mentioned. But my question to the panel is, how do we fast track the issue of human dignity for this continent? Because without it, we're all great with these numbers and the statistics. Thanks. Thank you. So we will take a couple of other rounds. So Please bear with us. So I think there were two or three key questions that came up. I, I love some of the points around courage and the need for young people to really empower the next generation and address the issue of mindset so that young people don't get used. But I think there were two questions around 50 co 54 countries in Africa and not, not, not really one country. So what do we do about it? And then the issue of human dignity. Any reactions? Just very briefly, a gentleman from Nigeria, if I may, and I'm going to be slightly intentionally provocative here, is arguably the, the last half a century, our states remain poor today because of conflict, because of ideology, and institutional management failure. Three headlines for me. If states, individual nation states with sovereignty are unable to manage their own affairs effectively towards progressive development, not just growth, development. What makes us think that throwing our lot in, in a multinational, multilateral uh, platform for this implementation will be any better? I would adopt more of a state-specific responsibility around implementation of all these fantastic initiatives we discuss or propose, rather than a multilateral, multinational approach. Any other reactions? Yeah. Just One about reaction, the yeah. human dignity? Sorry? About the human dignity, yeah? Yes, I, I just to say that, uh, as I said before, uh, for human dignity, we have four things. The first, we need to give food. The second, health. The third, education. And the third, transparency and participation. Uh, I work, I'm a social entrepreneur, I work with children from poor and less fortunate families. Yeah. They ask only for these four things, they don't want something less. Democracy is, is a theory, a concept for them. If they have transparency, if they have food, health and education, they have their dignity and they can help us to increase the growth of our continent. So let's empower the people to empower themselves. Exactly. Please, Anne. I think on human dignity, I would add to the four that you laid out, um, preventable human indignities that include, for instance, maternal death. Okay. Things like maternal death or, chi or early child death. These are things that we have learned for years and decades about how we can solve some of these b basic challenges. What concerns me is that as much as we know what to do, somehow our investments are not equal to the effort that is required. And I think there needs to be a much, much more significant investment there. Because without that dignity and without the mothers, we're not going to be able to translate real development to, to, to our families. I think another human indignity that I, that I find is a, big, is a growing phenomenon, I think linked to the urbanization issue as well, is the issue of gender-based violence. Gender-based violence seems to be on the rise in many of our countries, um, in, whether in situations of conflict or situations of perceived peace. We find gender-based violence as something that becomes sort of acceptable norms 
I mean, no, you know, it's almost like a norm, and we need to be able to start shifting that and taking some very serious steps. So there's a call on leaders, no matter who you are or where you are, to take this issue very seriously and show that your, your political and, 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 and uh, uh, institutional public service will is there to actually see the end of this. And I think there's ways of doing this. We've been working on a campaign using mobile phones on gender-based violence. And we found ways to get young people to engage with mobile education. And we've had young people come forward and say, I didn't realize I was a rapist. I didn't realize that this was criminal. Um, so it is possible for us to actually address some of these issues of human dignity very, very directly. Thank you, Anne. Let's take a second round of questions. I think there is one question here, and then there are a few over there as well. Yeah. Um, my name is Lola, and I am from the Global Shaper Hub in Lagos. Um, and I like that we've been talking about solutions, and you've been focusing on solutions. Yes. And I'm just thinking about my experiences as a Global Shaper and part of the Global Shaper community. Um, and just thinking about some of the numbers that we had um, about there being about 229 hubs you know, around the world now, um, more than 50, 50 something hubs in Africa, more than 30, more than 39, I think, in Africa. So, and each of us, we need to have a project that we do, you know, per quarter or per, per um, year or whatnot. And I'm just thinking about how powerful that is if we think about 229 hubs doing projects in their community every quarter. Um, and I just wanted to use this forum uh, just to represent not just the shapers here, but that there are many of us out there and we're coming to you to ask for help, to ask for support. And this is some of, you know, these are some of the ways that we can actually start to action change in our communities. So basically a call out saying, you know, if any, if any global shaper helps contact you, please help them? Yes, please. <laughs> okay, there was one question here, uh, then another one here, then we'll take two there and then third round. Good evening. Um, my name is Dako Iwale. I'm from Nigeria as well. And since uh, Anne started with the Nigerian proverb, please allow me to do the same, which is, it says often what you're looking, well, what, you, what you're looking for in Sokoto is in the pocket of your Shokoto. Meaning, if you're looking for something and you think it's far away, often it's much closer than you think. Mm -hmm. Attending different sessions, some on the private sector, some on the public sector, some on the civil society sector, it seems to me that Many of the questions about Africa and how we achieve the promise, we actually already have the answers for. What the challenge is, is that we have this knowledge and they're siloed. The skills are siloed. So in the private sector, there are skills, but they don't transfer into the civil society. Mm -hmm. Civil society has skills, but they don't transfer into the public sector. So my question to the eminent panel will be, how do we create this conveyor belt of skills that can actually help us to deliver on Africa's How do promise? we create the conveyor belt of skills? I love the use of language. Mm -hmm. Yeah. One here? S sorry, can you, yeah. Then uh, my name is uh, Kumar, okay, it's K.S. Kumar. Uh, I just uh, had a question. Actually, I'm just looking at the World Economic Forum being committed to improving the state of the world. And now I think if there's one part of the world where there'll be more listening, you know, I think Africa will be one part of the world where all of the leadership of these countries would be more open to listening and are, they'll be more coachable if there's a neutral party, you know, some other organization, like World Economic Forum, uh, took a, a leadership role in terms of thought leadership, in terms of providing some kind of a governance, in terms of bringing all these global shapers and leaders of Africa together uh, in an in a, in a organized way, so that there could be more, like you said, your point about action. There could be some way to put some roadmap of what can happen, what can be done, how can you influence the, the governments and the, you know, the, the decision makers of all these countries to come together on some common agenda. It may not be a lot of things, those will be economic agendas, of course, not interfering with their politics of those, of, of those countries. So how can you bring this all together to some form or but shape? Anything that you will do. Oh, sure. I mean, I, in fact, I'd like to speak to uh, World Economic Forum and say how can we help in, in putting our might to, you know, behind them from a private sector point of view in a private-public you know, partnership model. 
for influencing you know, things in this part of the world. For example, yeah. I did say and talk about education and training and how we could be working with young people earlier about in universities, for example, right. you so know, skilling and so on. Basically yeah. funding some activities through the forum. Well, in many ways, so funding, supporting, you yeah. know. Very good, creating, thank you. Yeah. Thank you, that's good. Yeah. Thank you very much. My name is Wadi Ait Hamza. I'm from the Rabat Hub of the Global Shapers community. And I'm eager to answer your first question. Yes. Uh, what can be done? I think it's really easy. Uh, we, we just need to commit ourselves. In committed to improving the state of the world, we need to commit ourselves to improve the state of Africa. As Lola said, with the Global Shapers, we had yesterday a meeting and we all committed ourselves to do local projects at the local level. We are 50 shapers, we come from 59 hubs. We are working on Monday, we're gonna start working on that. Um, the Economist 13 years ago had the, the cover, the hopeless Africa. Two years ago, it was Africa rising. Two months ago, it was aspiring Africa. And it needs on Monday to be Africa in action. But we need to commit ourselves. So my question is to you. So my question is, what do you think these gentlemen and ladies here can commit th themselves so that Monday things will be in action? What, what, do, what do you want them to be doing starting Monday? Thank you. So I think that's a fantastic question to start bringing the conversation to an end. And of course, such sessions I think should be more than an hour, an hour and a half because there is so much richness trying to integrate everything. But let me maybe take some reactions starting with Anne. So Africa in action. Any thoughts? Um, I think on that point about the conveyor belt of skills that Dapo raised, um, the, I think the very gentleman who was speaking now from Rabat uh, in, in a session that we had on uh, uh, skills and education, I think, was emphasizing how important it is for us to start entrepreneurial training with small kids. And that if we can begin to inculcate an entrepreneurship mindset, um, at a very young stage, then we begin to create long-term problem solvers who can integrate whether in civil society or public sector or private sector. Um, but that obviously is a long-term story. I don't think there is a, really is a short-term story other than what uh, a gentleman from the Royal Buffalo King in South Africa shared with us just earlier this afternoon and he used very, very, very powerful words. He said their philosophy is exposure, exposure early and exposure all the time. Great. Which I thought was, was very, very powerful. Great. Yeah. Thank you, Anne. Aminata? Okay. Um, well, I think um, thank you to the lady from Angola. Um, that was inspirational. And I'm glad to see that there are lots of young global shapers that are also asking lots of questions because we are the future. So I do believe that um, there's a lot of things that are lacking in, in Africa, but that we also have a lot of talent that's just waiting to be discovered. Um, data availability, I think that's something that we really, we have so much data in um, our hands, but we don't have access to it. So we need to find like a database where we can find human resources. If we're looking for someone in agriculture, let's, we should be able to use technology to be able to find what we're looking for. So I think education also is something very important that goes hand in hand with a lot of things. Um, including um, food security, agriculture. I, I'm sorry, I'm a senior, um, I'm a sales and marketing person for, in agriculture. So I think if we do not, we're not able to feed one another, then we're not able to get educated. So we really need to tackle the agriculture um, sector to be able to tackle health, education, women empowerment, good governments, food security. And uh, lastly, to um, the man from Nigeria, um, skills and, um, and human, human resources, we have a lot of skills. We just need to deliver it. Okay, Younes, quickly. Yes, I want to answer to the question of Wadi. Uh, and what I ask you, and I ask myself all the days, uh, I think we need to, all the attendants, to continue to invest in social entrepreneurship. Uh, we need to focus in health, education, and food, social entrepreneurship. The second thing, it's more for the youth and it's also for me, we, and in Africa, we need to invest in politics. We, we need to take our voice into account. And the third and last thing for uh, the uh, elder leaders is to help youth people 
by fundraising, for instance, by their point of views, by sharing their experiences. So there are the two, three things that I have to ask for the attendance. Thank you. Sure. Um, just two final comments. Um, with regards to the conveyor belt sort of, of skills, I, I sort of return back to the issue of sort of co-creation and open data. And the only way that we're going to be able to all start working on the same problem is if we all get access to the same data. And what this has done in developed markets so that people with expertise <coughs> can apply themselves where government and public sector doesn't have skills. Um, sort of, and lastly, to reiterate the call for action, um, I would say that, especially as young people, we often born into this environment in Africa where we feel this has always been the same. Africa has sort of always been underdeveloped and poor and not sure how to get out of that and say that um, I think we're all coming to a point where we're more conscious and aware that this sort of situation was created by centuries of very complicated history and this kind of poverty and underdevelopment was designed and constructed and realized that if that kind of thing can create it, we can also redesign a new status quo um, and design prosperity for our own continent. Eric, um, we will look back in 10 years, 20 years. What will have become of this robust growth that we're enjoying? If we look back and we do not have viable, substantive private sectors in African high growth economies, we would have failed. This can only be achieved through higher trust, high trust, or at least higher trust political economies in each individual African state. For me, um, the future of Africa, the future of the, to truly benefit from this growth, we need to create companies, businesses, economies. Without that, it's, it's built on sand. As someone who has entrepreneurship very close to his heart, I think those words are very important because I think we covered a number of issues today. Uh, and I would like to really uh, invite all of you, as you basically go back to your offices, as you go back to your homes, to really keep this idea in mind that uh, the outcome of the metamorphosis of Africa depends on the actions that each one of us take every day. And I thank you for your contribution today. And I would like to also uh, ask you to help me in thanking the panel for all the insights that they offered. I think that uh, last but not least, we are now to think about the future. So I would like to invite the World Economic Forum and Minister from Nigeria to uh, come and address us. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, as you might see, I'm, I'm, we don't have the Nigerian minister here yet, but it is my pleasure to, to introduce her um, in a couple of minutes. On behalf of the World Economic Forum, I am uh, pleased to see that um, um, and, and also congratulate the panel on a, on a great contribution. But I'm also uh, summing up this meeting. It's very clear to me and also listening to all the young voices that the era of uh, pessimism is definitely over in Africa. It is, it is a lot of optimism, but also a lot of realism. We see substantial economic growth, Africa growing, the African lions even growing faster uh, than the Asian tigers with a lot of potential, but also the realism saying that if this growth is not investing invested in human capital and in diversifying economies, we can lose out on opportunities. And um, diversifying economies and also then focusing on educations and skills is very, very important in the youngest continent in the world. Listening to all the global shapers is energizing, but we also know that this continent will move from one billion people today and will become two billion people in 2050. So there are a lot of jobs that have to be created for a continent where 70% of the population is under 30 years old. And I think Madame Suma, the chairperson of the African Union, she summed it up very well yesterday when 
She said, in 50 years, Africa should be a prosperous continent at peace with itself. But there are some prerequisites for meeting this. It is unlocking a lot of investments in infrastructure. Unlocking those investments in infrastructure will also lead to enhanced food production. It will also increase trade in Africa and trade spearheads jobs and jobs higher up in the value chain. So Africa will also be manufacturing goods for Africa. African will also buy African labels and African products. This is the vision that also the World Economic Forum would like to support in partnership with business, but also with political leaders and also with civil society. First, you need to have growth then you need to make sure that the growth reaches everyone. This continent does not need handouts. It needs a handshake in the sense of partnership with the rest of the world. On behalf of the World Economic Forum, and also Professor Schwab, our founder and executive chair person, I'm very pleased and I would like to thank the South African government and President Zuma for unparalleled support and commitment to this summit. I also would like to <laughs> I also would like to thank our distinguished uh, co-chairs for their commitment and also their hard work in the run-up to this summit. And now I have come to the Nigerian minister the finance minister, our friend, Ngozi Onkanshu uh, Ivela. She will make a very important announcement. And uh, minister, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Vorge. And I'm very pleased that I didn't have to sum up the summit, and that has fell to you. But I'll tell you one thing, you know, after listening to the panel here of the young people and the questions from the young global shapers, I don't know about you, but I felt very encouraged, very energized. And I felt like, you know, they are the ones that are giving us the hope that we have people coming who are really going to be engaged, people who care, people who are passionate people who raise the right issues, and ultimately people who take this continent forward. So I just want you to applaud, <laughs> applaud this panel and uh, applaud all our young people. I also want to thank the South African government, the Professor and Mrs. Schwab and the World Economic Forum team, the co-chairs, and uh, all of you uh, for making this a very exciting uh, event this time around. And now... Now that we have to talk about uh, the future, um, I can't help but say that, um, oh, just one word, that uh, you know, if there's a, a future uh, for Africa, surely that future lies very much in Nigeria. And, um, you know, when you, you say that, you know you have both a responsibility and a challenge because we have the largest population on the continent. I think we epitomize a lot of things about Africa. We have the excitement, uh, the passion, the entrepreneurship, uh, the private sector drive, um, the glow for the future. But we also epitomize all of the difficult challenges that the continent also needs to face be it from infrastructure uh, to human capital development to governance and corruption to transparency to all the issues, you find both the opportunities and the challenges bundled up in this country. And that's what makes it one of the most exciting countries to be in on the continent. And I, I do hope that with that I've excited your imagination because I'm speaking to invite you next year uh, to Nigeria for the next edition of the World Economic Forum Africa. Thank you. Thank you. 
Thank you. I, I have to say that the uh, World Economic Forum has been gracious enough to pick Abuja as the city. So uh, those of you, I'm allowed to say that, am I not? <laughs> because I know some people want to start making arrangements ahead of time. But we are very excited. Uh, we are working hard. We have a marvelous team working on this. And I can assure you of a, an exciting forum next year. Thank you very much. Oh, sorry. Um, thank you, Frank, for reminding me. We are hosting a reception right outside. When you step out, come in for some Nigerian culture, poetry, music, and some entertainment. Thank you. Thank you so much, um, Minister Ngozi. I think you could hear from the applause that there's a lot of excitement. Even uh, on a Friday late afternoon or early evening, you got this warm applause, and we're so excited about going to Nigeria uh, next year. I would then um, like to call on my colleague, Elsie Kansa. As you know, she's our Africa uh, director. We could not have had this summit without uh, Elsie's commitment and her team's commitment. So Elsie, I would like to thank you, and I'll give Elsie uh, the formal opportunity to close the summit. Thank you very much, Jorge, and thanks to everyone. 19 years ago today, the first democratically elected president of the Republic of South Africa was inaugurated. It is fair to say that a new dawn began, not just for South Africa, but for Africa as a whole. Today I feel very excited that Africa seems to be at the same tipping point. At the beginning of the meeting, we talked about how we wanted to use this meeting to move, to move the agenda away from if Africa can deliver on its promise to how. I think we've achieved that. I'm very happy to say not only has the attendance been unprecedented, but so has the quality of the ideas and actions that have come out of this meeting. Amongst other outcomes, Nigeria has joined the Grow Africa Partnership. The Africa Strategic Infrastructure Initiative has received a mandate to proceed with identifying demo projects to advance public-private partnership investment models across Africa, and we launched the 2013 Africa Competitiveness Report. Now, as Africa has learned the hard way, success is a journey, not a destination. So let's keep working hard on bold decisions, fast actions, and strong collaboration. Last but not least, I would like to recognize all those who've worked extremely hard behind the scenes to make all of this possible. The government and the task force, and in particular our main focal point, Lindiwe Mathada, our co-chairs and official partners, the Africa team, Sophie Busman, Robin Coulter, Patrick McGee, uh, by extension, Marius Hugo, proudly South African, as well as Helene Laurent from the membership team. Um, I'm not going to recognize everyone, but uh, Joanna Deuce and Kim Hugo uh, on events and operations, Natalie Chalmers and Rebecca Ivey on the program development team, Michael Drexler and Pedro Delmeida on the, uh, on the business engagement side. There's a lot of people who work to make all of this possible. Um, I can't go into it, but uh, I'd like to acknowledge them. I'd also like to uh, give our thanks to our you know, our venue host, the city ICC, the Westin Hotel, the Southern Sun, Kalinan, the one and only, and to some extent, Mount Nelson. And finally, all good things must come to an end. Size si bonane futi, size si bonane kwakona, ritla bonana kape, tot vir sins, ate proximo, atre bianto, until we meet again. <laughs>